So good afternoon, everyone. Um, oh, it, good morning if you're dialing in from other places such as the States. Um, Jennifer Liston Smith, Head of Coaching of My Family Care here. A uh, very warm welcome to all of you for joining us. We've had over 100 people registering for the webinar today, and the number of attendees that we can see online are climbing. But I think not everybody is here quite as yet. I'm delighted to say that we do have on the line with us already Mel Flockdell from Centrica, who is our special guest today. And we'll be um, interviewing Mel in some detail as to your journey with Centrica, where you're head of HR policy. So welcome to you, Mel. Hello, thank you. And um, as discussed, I'd really invite you to chip in as I go through some um, preliminary parts of the webinar discussing our recent parent and carer survey, for example. Do feel free, Mel, to to chip in if there are things there that you'd like to comment on. But we've got a particular uh, point during the webinar where we'll come to Mel for a, an account of Centrica's journey and the impact that you've had there. But uh, you've had a very successful period of recognition of your work, haven't you, including some recognition in the Working Families Top Employers Awards recently, so congratulations on that. Thank you very much. I'm sure people are very keen to hear what you have to say. But I'm also pleased to say that when we sent out a survey asking for people's input in terms of questions and challenges, several people came forward and said that they were willing to provide um, tips and hints or stories of their journey. And, um, and so we're going to be inviting a few people that have flagged that up previously to, to speak up online as we go along. So I'm going to to go forward. I know there will be people joining, um, so I'm kind of allowing a little bit of a, a lead in there. But I want to let you know, as we, we move into the, the webinar here, a little bit about who we've got online. Um, at least these are the sectors that have signed up. Um, I think the main point to say is that there's a, a real range of sectors represented. Um, I think the brown um, segment over on the right hand side is energy, for example. The blue one at the front is manufacturing. Um, the lilac one at the back I think is consumer goods. So a lot of different sectors um, you can see from the, the range there that are interested and indeed working on this topic of flexibility in the workplace. For those of you who don't already know us, I think many of you on the line are, are clients, contacts and friends of My Family Care. Um, for those of you who don't yet know as well, in a nutshell, My Family Care is all about enabling employers to make work and family work. And that's particularly relevant to employers, generally given the growing number of us with care responsibilities. Care is no longer a female issue, particularly with the advent of a, a growing interest in those caring for other adults or elders. Um, and of course, the whole issue of flexibility, we are delighted to say as a, a, a an organization that's focusing particularly on those with care needs, we're really delighted that flexibility is becoming everybody's interest and need, and indeed simply a better way of doing business, and that will really come out in what Mel shares with us afterwards. So there are lots of different ways into thinking about flexibility, and one of the ways that sometimes we start is to look at the needs of particular groups, but My Family Care is delighted that it's no longer really a conversation about the needs of those groups. Um, that said, our recent Working Parent and Carer Survey did, in fact, sample working parents and carers, as a clue in the name, um, and it, it actually shows a lot of, of common ground with what's going on in the world of applying flexibility more generally anyway. I want to let you know that we're recording the session. Um, we'll invite you to ask questions. You can type questions at any point, and we'll keep a, a note of those questions coming in and, and either answer them immediately or find an appropriate moment. And as I say, there'll be a point later on where there'll be a bit more interactivity verbally as well. Um, we can provide you with a copy of the slides afterwards and indeed the results of a couple of polls that we'll be running anonymously during the, the course of the webinar. Um, and indeed a copy of the Working Parent and Carer Survey, which I'll be touching upon. So you can have those. We're also going to write up a transcript of the webinar, which we'll be very happy to provide to you later on. So what did we say we were going to look at today? We wanted to share with you the um, results of the survey in broad terms. 
um, we want to support those of you who are at different points in the journey in terms of getting flexibility embedded. So how do you make the case? How do you get leaders on board? And a couple of things that frequently come up when we're engaging with organizations, perhaps training managers or sitting down with HR and diversity leaders on how do we move this forward? How do we get best practice that's in one area shared into another? One of the areas that often comes up is, is the, the, the difficulty. And it, you know, it is a challenge of communicating flexibility for those who are in transactional roles, client-facing or customer-facing roles. So we need to touch on that. And um, we'll engage you, as I said, in a couple of, of polls, and we can let you see the results of who else online is looking at things in the same way or in different ways. And indeed, um, some real gritty insights from Mel, which would be most welcome. When you were asked what your current challenges are, having a business case and getting it started with a, an appropriate framework for your organization is clearly an issue. Getting the culture to move from where perhaps inflexible working would be the norm, but some people are just kind of doing it and maybe not putting themselves forward as role models and case studies, so it's not spreading, it's not being recognized as something that really benefits the business because it's not really joined up and talked about. Um, managing individual requests and managing expectations, a lot of you were contributing points about it needing to be a two-way street, and that comes out resoundingly in our survey too, that it actually works best where it's flexible rather than rigid, um, and where the individual understands and makes the business case and is prepared to offer flexibility in return. Um, and again, managers, key point in the survey and a key point in the, the points that you were raising. The impact of, of greater flexibility on managers, it requires new perspectives, new skills, equipping managers in every sense, including technology and, and shared best practice and monitoring managers, checking that they have what they need, checking that they're doing what they're expected to. Obviously this is a, a huge area, the whole area of, of getting flexibility more embedded in organizations or even just beginning down the route or even just getting some practical tips and hints on how to implement and operate flexibility for working parents and care. As some of you on the line may be simply looking at that. And what we aim to do is, is to create a bit of a focus today, engage in some dialogue, give you some points that you can then take and action in your organization. So we can't give you the full story, but we're certainly going to point you to some resources as well along the way, which will really help you, hopefully spurred on by this discussion today, to look at what the impact would be in your organization, to look at the business case, to look at the easy wins. Um, and that's really what we're we're aiming to do to kind of spark your further action. So indeed in relation to the challenges that you're facing, I'd like to launch the first poll of the webinar. Your um, responses will be anonymous on the screen, so we're going to invite you to, to do that with a view to having a look at what others are doing as well as letting us know what you're doing. So I'm just bringing up the poll now. What challenges are you facing? And you'll see that appearing on your screen just now. So please do respond. And I'll, I'll keep it open for a little while to give you a chance to do that. I can see that some of you are voting already. I know it needs a few moments to, to think about which are the, the most pressing challenges for you. Um, just looking at the results coming in on the screen, it seems to be that there's quite a need in terms of, of culture and managers. But uh, I can see 80% of you that are now online have voted, which is great. I'm going to let that run for another little while. As I said earlier, if you have any questions that you want to put, do feel free to type them in. Okay, I'm, I can see that 90% of you have voted. I might close the poll now and share the results with you on screen. So I'll just let you have a moment to look at those results. So we can see that far and away engaging and managing managers um, is an issue for nearly three quarters of you. Um, and indeed changing the leadership culture, making the business cases a, a, a kind of prerequisite for that, but getting leaders to 
embrace flexible working perhaps as a business strategy rather than an individual benefit is often what I hear going hand in hand with with that challenge but it's very interesting how the managers very much the key person in the middle is um, is coming up as a place to to go to focus on moving forward so interesting results there and as I say you'll get a copy of those um, sent to you when uh, when we finish the webinar so just a little bit more I'm not going to dwell on these we just kind of pulled out some of the verbatim responses that were being fed in by you so I think I'll just let you have a read of some of those um, a lot of it as you see falls into those kind of categories where we're trying to move flexibility from being an exception to being the norm convincing managers and indeed leaders of, of how that will benefit the business um, and looking at a culture sometimes where flexibility just you know isn't that easy to to make fit Mel I don't know whether you have any comments it's fine if you haven't but it, anything that strikes you here at the moment um, no I think it's um, the moving from the informal to formal um, and I think that that's when I come on to, to talk later about what we've done in Centrica I think that um, We've definitely got some tips there of, of perhaps how to go about that. Yes, absolutely. So we'll we'll look forward to that because that's certainly something that you did very consciously in a way, wasn't it, to actually go out there and, and make it make it formal. Um, so at the manager level, here are some more challenges. It's about getting managers to buy into the concept, so managers of all levels, I guess, um, and then implementing it, perhaps when it entails a... a a focus on attracting and retaining different talent to really communicate that message to managers that it's about ensuring diversity in the workforce by engaging people that may not be able to carry on working in certain phases of their life cycle without flexibility which is you know sometimes seen as a rather soft measure but we know through for example the catalyst studies that have been done that boards that are gender balanced tend to outperform boards that are single gender on you know the, the kind of rigid financial return on investment measures that, that senior leaders at least would be looking for so it's about making the case all the way up around how it's going to improve working and, and improve engagement of people and that in itself improves performance yeah and manage the key to that absolutely yes and that really came out in our survey a lot of really heartfelt quotes um, written in by people saying that the manager really makes the difference, both appreciating where they had a, a really positive understanding manager and finding it really challenging where the manager didn't trust them or, or just didn't see any kind of give and take. At an individual level, there are challenges in helping sometimes an individual make the case, be flexible with their requests and be focused on deliverables, focus on business outcomes. Um, and of course there as we see on the screen um, being afraid that if you agree to flexibility for one in a team others will ask now I know that's an argument that gets turned on its head when we say let's make flexibility the norm which is very much what you've done at um, Centrica isn't it Mel yeah yeah and I think you know that uh, flexibility can mean different things for, for different people so it's you know Sometimes it's just about staggered start and finish time. Sometimes it's about part-time working. Sometimes it's about working from home. Sometimes it's, you know, it's about shift work. I mean, in, a, in our organisation, we've got a number of different roles, so um, flexibility um, is, varies across the board. Um, but I think, you know, it, it's something that everyone can consider. Um, and, you know, some people don't want to work flexibly. So, you know, I think... When, when I sort of come on to talk about our, our approach, our team approach, um, then I think that, that that will help to overcome some of that. And there is always the the option to trial it. If you're if you're not sure, you can still give it a go and, and review it after a few months' time. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and I think having having a trial is key in so many ways. It's key to making the case when you can prove the outcomes. It's also key to deciding what the deliverables are and how they can be measured, which is such a vital part in proving that flexibility works and in helping managers to manage it. And I think trialing with mutually agreed criteria is, is a really important step in doing that. 
I can see a couple of people are typing in points saying things like it, the, the transfer from informal to formal is, is such a, a crucial point and things like that. So thank you for those comments. Uh, the, the other thing that I would say at the outset, um, I was at a, a really good event at Ernst & Young last night which was a, a book launch and book signing event of the book which you, I've made a reference to on a slide later so you'll see that called Future Work written by Alison Maitland and Peter Thompson. Um, and the point was made there um, very strongly by several people who were in a, a panel discussing flexibility, but particularly Fiona Laird, who's a senior VP at Unilever, that there are three key pieces of this jigsaw. We're looking here at the people side, but as, as we know, whenever we start talking about this as a whole scale culture change in an organization, we're looking at the people side. We're also looking at real estate planning and we're looking at technology and those go hand in hand and in fact the real estate is the place where you would look if you were doing flexibility whole scale you would look for your cost savings because ultimately if you're desk based for, for a large proportion of your workers then you'd be looking for fewer desks um, ultimately um, so there are ways that we're focusing on the people side and we need to keep remembering that if we're going to do this whole scale, there are bigger changes that, that need to take place. And I'd like to invite you to comment at this point about where you are in that continuum, if you like, between doing it in a kind of piecemeal way or avoiding doing it altogether and, and seeing it as a way of doing business which entails big changes towards better IT and different use of building space. I was even hearing last night again, as we hear very often with organizations that have really got hold of this, that if you're really looking at flexibility as the norm, then the way that you design your buildings would be different too. They'd be activity spaces for meetings and discussions because a lot of desk based work can be done off-site remotely. So where are you in that continuum? Are you at the, we've given this, we've put together a little metric for you just for this webinar. And we've used, as you can see, the, the word flexi to give that a bit of a memorable shape. So are you at the point of, of really trying to avoid it? Are you at the point of fulfilling the legal minimum, those people who have a right to request flexible working, so parents of children under 17 or under 18 if a child is disabled, carers of other adults, are you just responding to those groups and other flexibility has to stay under the radar? Have you opened it up so that other people can work flexibly? And many of our clients are at that stage, certainly, where nobody has to to be looking at childcare or elder care. You could be having a flexible working application to look after a horse or to go and study an MBA or train for a triathlon. Many of, of the organizations that we're aware of are at that level. But some have taken it even further, and they're using it as part of their brand, almost, if you like. They'll talk with clients about it. They'll use it in terms of, of attracting talent. It's very much an identity um, in terms of this is how we do business. And then ultimately, beyond that, there's a, a way in which the whole of the, the, the office space um, has been changed, the whole way that meetings take place. There's a presumption meetings will be virtual and so on with all the cost save in terms of carbon footprint and travel costs. So where are you on that continuum? I'd invite you to vote now. So thank you for, for voting. I see it's climbing quite a lot. And just to, to let you know, we had a limit on the number of characters we could type in for the poll. So it's 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 a you know a summary of the points I was making earlier, but I'm sure you you've got the gist of, of where we are with that, whether you're avoiding it, just doing the bare legal minimum, making it open to all, using it as part of how you're you're viewed in the world or really just it being a presumption of that being the best way of, of doing business. I'm going to close the poll in a couple of seconds now because most of you have voted, I can see. And the results will be coming up on your screen, which is quite interesting to see. There's a very low percentage of you that are actually using it as a, a, a complete business model. Some of you are talking about it out there as part of the way you do things and very few, I'm pleased to see, uh, very few of you are actually avoiding it at all costs. Interestingly, the bulk of us are, are really in those first two categories. But I'm finding it encouraging to see that 38% of you are in that, that pool of making it available across the board to people regardless of caring 
responsibilities. So that's great. Thank you very much for engaging with that. So just as I promised, a little bit of a, a, a summary of some of the points that came out of our Working Parents and Carers survey. We will send this to you so you'll have the summary report. Therefore, there's no need for me to kind of labor it in detail, but just to, to kind of flag up some of the key themes that really relate to the whole flexibility debate. It had about 1,500 respondents, um, and it was open to working parents and carers. Now, as we said, you know, it's no longer a parents and carers issue, flexibility. It's not really an issue. It's, it's the smart way of doing business in the world in which we are living, where Generation Y is coming through with a very different view of work. The technology is there to enable better ways of working that cost less in terms of cash, in terms of carbon footprint. There are changing expectations, even within parents, there are changing expectations of men to be more involved, particularly at the point of becoming new dads. There are many dual income families with children, so it's no long, longer the dinkies without any kids, but most families have a, a, a if, if they are made up of a male and female partner or two same-sex partners, in most of those families, both of those parents would be working for some kind of economic gain these days. So this is a survey that reflects that particular group of people, and these are some of the, the ways that they were working flexibly. So we can see 65% of them were working full-time. This is not necessarily about part-time working, but one of the things that came out is, is that it's about flexibility as to when and where and how we work rather than purely cutting down hours. And I think that's one of the myths that we increasingly need to blow out of the water, that when we're talking about flexibility, we're not talking about rigid part-time working. We're often just talking about smarter ways of putting in the hours. Now, the headline themes, we were quite struck that over 50% of parents and carers are not currently happy with their work-life balance according to the respondents to this survey. And where they were happy with it, there was a really strong correlation between that happiness with work-life balance and all sorts of strong business benefits, their performance, albeit self-rated, their perception of their productivity, their loyalty and commitment to their employer, their sense of being valued by their employer as well. Um, so there was a real benefit for the organization in people being happy with their work-life balance. And that work-life balance was a key factor when we said to people, what would make your work-life balance better? A key factor in that was how flexibly they're already working in terms of time and place. So being very happy with work-life balance was a strong indicator that people had flexibility over time and place of work. And where they were very happy, it was yielding these benefits. 68% um, of those who were very happy were really committed to their employer versus 30%. 66% of those very happy with their work-life balance were very productive compared with 29% who were very unhappy with work-life balance. 85% of those who feel valued by their employer, oh, sorry, who were very happy feel valued by their employer versus 25%. So huge gains from flexibility. 54%, um, however, were concerned that the, there may be some impact on career progression through using flexibility, and that resonates with other surveys, certainly one that the Association for Women Solicitors did last year with um, King's College um, that indicated that career progression was a concern where people are working flexibly. Um, really important was the need for managers who understood, who get it, as the participants said, the need for technology that's enabling of working in different times and places, and good support outside of work, things such as care arrangements, things such as good communications and support at home within a, a family structure. A lot of people reporting they can no longer, for example, turn to close relatives for care needs because we simply don't live that way any longer. People are not necessarily around and available. Therefore, the need to have really good care in place, be it childcare or elder care, and contingency planning, you know, backup arrangements for when care breaks down and so on. These were things that people were flagging up as really enabling and contributing to the work-life balance. It was also apparent that care is no longer a gender-based issue, albeit that it was a sort of 80-20 split women to men on childcare between the respondents who were reporting that that was what they were caring for, they were caring for children. But those who were caring for adults and elders, there was um, a 60-40 split, women to men. So many men involved in caring roles there. And we can see very strongly the, 
the two-way street in action on the slide that I'm going to bring up in a, a moment for you. That's just coming onto your screens. A couple of quotes from participants in the survey showing that where they feel they've been treated flexibly and they've been given support and understanding, they are paying that back in dividends. They're, they're really committing and making sure things get done. And where that isn't available, there's there's a kind of sense of, you know, why should I go the extra mile all the time if that's not being returned. There are some other quotes which I'm going to, to leave with you to have a little look at on the screen for a moment when that comes up then that should be arriving with you just now. Um, one of the things that really strikes me looking at this is again the key role of managers and um, the pivotal role that a good manager plays and you know maybe there are different kinds of understanding that managers need, certainly managers who are looking at flexibility as a whole team really need opportunities to sit down and consult with the team and look at how we work. And this is one of the best ways of reducing resentment against parents and carers that the whole team sits down and talks about flexibility. But it's also important for managers to understand that, that parents and carers do have particular needs across the lifestyle needs and challenges change, across generations needs and challenges and ways of working are different. So it's important to, to raise awareness, I think, also of specific groups as well as looking at flexibility generally. So the practical implications are, are kind of quite clear in, in how they've emerged so far, but just to give them a bit of a recap there, even if we're not looking at changing to mass flexibility across the board, it's important to make the business case for these parents and carers, for example, demonstrating very strongly the, the way in which their productivity, their commitment is enhanced by being happy with work-life balance and their happiness with work-life balance is fueled by having flexibility over how and when they work and having some understanding from managers. So the manager is pivotal and that throws up the, the question of how we get managers to that level of understanding and support. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, the manager who understands that working parents and carers have something specific um, that needs supporting and, and needs um, acknowledging and perhaps looking to what the employer can also do for life outside work. Can we help practically? Can we help with care needs? Can we help with a kind of concierge service? Um, and obviously the, the technology and the trust and autonomy that managers can enable people to have. Do individuals have a, a right to flexible working? Well, as we know, certain groups, as I mentioned at the outset, have a right to request. But that doesn't mean they have a right to work flexibly. So there are various grounds for refusing that. And it's just worth touching here as a sort of negative way up of looking at the problem because we ought to be looking at how we can make things flexible. But if we, if we want to turn it down, it's important to remember it has to be on specific business grounds. And it's not enough for a manager to turn down a request by saying, you know, it's just not going to work or others will ask and we can't accommodate that. So there needs to be some really concrete job-related factors and, and listing, you know, perhaps if there are higher costs, what those costs are, for example. So the practical implications for individuals from the survey are quite interesting. And, and that would be true whether this is working parents and carers or anybody working flexibly. The need to manage ourselves, the need for self-discipline, um, something that Sally Bucknell from Ernst & Young, again at the, the um, book launch event last night, was saying that we need technology to be liberating rather than enslaving. We need flexibility to liberate rather than enslave. It's very easy in a kind of BlackBerry-based culture to get drawn into 24-7 working, especially if we're teleconferencing with the states in the evening and data in the morning. So individuals need a bit of support and perhaps personal development in that management exercise. To understand from an individual point of view that it, uh, flexibility is the real meaning of the word, that it's about Perhaps, you know, if we need to get away from work at a certain time, are we able to log on later and contribute in, in that way if that's what we need to do in terms of our ambition and seniority and role and so on. So the individual needs to have a business focus. They need to be aware what the deliverables are in their role. And as we were saying earlier, that ties in with trialing, having a look at the criteria that would need to be met by that individual in their role to demonstrate it can be done flexibly. 
Um, I thought there, shall we talk about childcare? That's just because I was very struck that it was an 80-20 split in terms of women saying that they were taking responsibility for childcare. And I think there may be some scope on an individual level to have some better conversations at home about childcare, especially where a male-female couple is more balanced in terms of income, and I quite often find they are, and there's still a presumption that the childcare is the, the mother's job to sort out. There seems to be a real need to get the best care solutions in place. People were saying that that was a real contributor to their happiness, so it's just important to make available to people information on the choices that they have and, and perhaps support those, those choices and encourage individuals to look at their contingency planning as well as I touched on earlier. So making the business case, as we said, we can't make the case for you because it will be very specific to your organization, but there are some places you can go and resources that you can look at. I think one of the things that is really worth knowing, and, and Melanie will touch on this in a little while, is how for the businesses that are really doing it large scale, such as Centrica, it's actually about cost savings. That is the driver that gets leaders on board. Cost saving in, in real estate, in travel costs, in, in staff turnover, in absence. Um, so what can you measure now that would have some sort of impact? Are there savings that could be demonstrated in those ways? Are there gains in productivity and so on that you could measure a baseline now in terms of employee engagement, for example, and then get another uh, hook on that when you've got more flexibility in place. So here are some of the things that are likely to be impacted that I've got on the screen in front of you now. And it's about the best ways of working in the current economy. Some useful books, I mentioned Alison and Peter's book, that's really helpful in helping you understand the business case and the implementation of it. Another one actually that's really helpful for practical implementation and, and background is also on the screen, flexibility.co.uk, the website. Andy Lake, who's, who's the editor of that, has put together a, a really helpful book called The Smart Working Handbook, which is available to download from the website. And that will take you through some very practical steps for implementation as well. Um, Jody Thompson and Carly Ressler, they were behind the results only work environment um, project at Best Buy and they have written a book about how work ought to be different, you know, why did we presume you come to work at nine and you leave at five, how did that happen, especially in a global 24-7 economy, why would that still be relevant? Daniel Pink is on there because what motivates us turns out to be freedom and autonomy and control, much more than money. And you'll be aware of other sources of, of research and data and evidence that will really help you when you come to build your business case. Working Families, our friends at Working Families, the charity that's got a lot of research in this field, particularly the hours to suit, for example, the recent research on working fathers with um, Lancaster University Management School, which was a wonderful piece on how fathers benefit from flexibility, work-life balance, working for fathers. Opportunity Now um, produced a, a great piece of research out of office all about agile working and the, the benefits and the need for trust. And of course, our own website has lots of client case studies and, and guides and other resources there. So there's a lot out there to help you. Um, and indeed, on the line today, what could be better to help you than someone who's really been on the journey herself? Um, and that's Mel Flogdell, Head of HR Policy at Centrica. So Mel, would you like to talk us through how you got it all started and how it panned out for you at Centrica? Yeah, thank you. Um, I think, you know, we, we talked about um, there the, you know, the, the real commercial hook for businesses, um, and ours was, our, our business case for flexible working was really built on the idea of significant commercial property savings, as well as um, attracting and retaining a diverse workforce and promoting Centrica as an employer of choice. Um, and I'll start it off as Project Martini, um, anytime, any place, anywhere working. I love that, Mel. It's a great name. <laughs> Yes, um, it, it was popular, but we didn't think it was sustainable. Um, so <laughs> we, we re later renamed it as WorkWise. Um, and I think when we, we realized what a significant cultural change it was going to be, um, we, you know, we wanted something that, that, that was going to be sustainable. Um, 
and basically um, it was about um, employee empowerment, it was about individuals and teams deciding how flexible they could be while giving the same if not better service um, to their customers. Um, and this was offered to all individuals irrespective of grade or statutory requirements. Um, and it meant that they had control over their work-life balance um, whilst for, for, for us achieving a significant um, saving in, in the more efficient use of, of office space because we were looking to close a couple of our sites. Um, so it did mean that we needed to think more creatively about how we could rehouse the same number of employees but on, on fewer sites. And I think that you mentioned earlier, Jennifer, it is so important um, to have your facilities and your property teams on board with this um, because there are a number of things that you need to think about when moving to flexible working. It isn't just about arranging the hours and um, the, the working patterns and um, you know ag agreeing the outputs. It mm -hmm. is thinking about some of the facilities, parking, um, room booking, hot desking, etc., which I'll, I'll come on to talk about. Um, but also the, the health and safety aspects as well. Yes, so, and I think I think the fact uh, that you've been there and discovered these things is is really key because some of it isn't obvious until you actually get down that road. Yeah. yeah. Um, so for us, it was about embedding it into to our culture and our processes. It's not, you know, we didn't want it to be a one-off initiative. We wanted this to be a new way of working for us. Um, so we wanted to make sure that everyone had the tools and support. Um, to enable them to work effectively and efficiently where, wherever they were. Um, so we did look at new and upgraded working um, facilities, team footprints and breakout areas for more collaborative working as well. Um, I think that n not, not only are sort of the managers key to this, but the fact that performance is measured on objectives rather than um, presenteeism is also very important. So having a robust um, performance management process in place is, is vital as well. Yeah. And that therefore then employment opportunities are de determined by ability, not by your working pattern, working hours, working arrangements. So um, if we move on to the next sure. slide. Let's, I've brought that up. So here we go. It'll be hitting people's screens now. Okay, so this was our, our vision really. This is what we were currently facing. Um, our, our employees had, had told us about um, the amount of time that they'd spent um, on, on the road, sat in their cars, um, the, the fact that when they were trying to work from home, um, they didn't have the proper equipment and, and space um, to do that, and some of the frustrations about connectivity as well. Um, so we went from this image to the next one, um, which was really about um, a much more professional and efficient um, approach to flexible working. Are we moving on to the We are the indeed, slide? yes. It should be coming up on your screens in just a moment. So this is what we were looking for, um, a, a much more effective way of working from home, a more collaborative approach in the office to using wireless connectivity and, and breakout areas. Mm -hmm. um, or meetings and gatherings, and also the ability to work from any office um, that, that, that we have as well, not, not just having to, to base yourself in one area, um, but also working from, from clients' offices as well. So Absolutely. That, that was our, our vision pictorially. Mm, I think it's really interesting how building space maybe less as we've said because you know you can hot desk but also the way in which you use building space is different because if people are working remotely for example if that's a large part of how people are working flexibly then when they come into the office they're really going to want to maximize that time on site not just to sit sit down at a desk but to in fact engage with others and do the really important face-to-face -face stuff which is in some ways indispensable even if you have telepresence and really good video conferencing, there's still something about meeting face to face and the office needs to be almost built to accommodate that, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Right. Um, so we did face um, a number of, of challenges um, and I think the, the biggest one which um, 
is oh have we jumped ahead have we gone have we gone past a slide excuse me oh, okay. sorry I'll mel no we're, we're back now apologies okay. we went ahead um so some of the challenges that we faced were was really the biggest one was managers concern over loss of control how could they manage a team remotely um how could they know what what people were doing every every minute of the day well um managers can be in the office with their teams that still don't know what they're doing every minute of the day. So, um, you know, we needed to make sure that we over, overcame these concerns, and I'll talk about what we, we did, but we were very aware that managers um, did have their reservations, and we needed to overcome them and get them on board if this was going to be successful. Yeah, so um, certainly that would be a really good one to hear more about because we're having some questions typed in and one of the questions is how do you get managers to get it and how do you change the culture? So I think we'll be really glad to hear what in particular helped move move things forward on that front. Yeah, I'll come on to that then. Thank you. Um, team cohesion, so how would you maintain that when people were working remotely and working different hours? As I said, some of the practicalities around parking and facilities on site, so making sure that your catering offering is as good for those people that are starting early in the morning or perhaps working a bit later at night um, is also important. Um, vital to have the right technical equipment and IS support, um, so not just about um, you know when, when you're in the office but when you're, you're working from home and it's eight or nine o'clock at night um, and you might need some help. Um, then, you know, is there the IS support to back that up and, and does your equipment working from home, is it as, you know, as good as it can be? Yes, um, absolutely. Also health and safety, um, not just in the office but at home, so making sure that people weren't working in, a, in a, an unsafe way and making sure that um, the way that in which um, computers were set up um, were appropriate um, and, and, and um, that people felt comfortable um, and uh, and safe working from from home. Mm, absolutely. So, just on a, a really different point, when you mentioned working from home, we've just had somebody typing in that she's returned from maternity leave and her husband's chosen to become a house husband, so working from home in a very different way. And she wanted to to flag yeah. up that that's working really well. So just just throwing in that's from the conversation earlier about sharing of care responsibilities. I thought it's quite apt to absolutely. mention and I that. Think that it, it is important and. You know, when I when I come on to the next slide to talk about what we did with our staff, then taking into consideration is your home environment conducive to working from home and being a mobile worker is also an important factor as well, um, because for some people um, it, it, it may not be practical or suitable, um, but equally individuals might feel quite isolated and therefore working from home might not be the best thing for them if they're not very good at sort of being on their own um, or, you know, working from home for a couple of days without seeing people. So that's also important to take into consideration, you know, people's individual um, needs. Absolutely. In fact, somebody's asked a question about how we cater, how you would cater for those needs of people at home. Would you cover things like heating and lighting costs um, and, and broadband? Yes, we do. We've got um, three worker types. Um, we've got a, a, a mobile worker, we've got a home worker, and we've got an office worker, and we've got definitions of those and, and what percentage of their time is spent at home or being mobile um, or in the office. And that then dictates what um, support you get with regards to um, how much is paid for. So, for example, if you're working from home, then all of the facilities are paid for and heating and lighting. If you're a mobile worker, then connectivity is paid for. Um, and obviously you've got your, your laptop and your equipment to, to work from home as well. Um, so it was important to, to, to clarify that with, with employees and, and discuss the worker types with them, as well as then what the other areas of flexibility um, could, could be for them. Yes, yeah, that makes sense. Shall I move on to our, what we called our our work life journey. So, mm. you know, with these challenges in mind, um, then we needed to, to overcome these. Um, and I think the biggest thing for getting people on board um, was, was our road shows. So um, going out and um, engaging every site with presentations on what our vision of flexible working was. 
um, and also having learning zones, which would be um, a, a model office environment, um, which we established where managers and employees were encouraged to go and visit so they could experience what workwise would be and look like, so both in the office and working from home. So we had a mock-up, because um, some people can't really envisage what that could look like, so that really helped some people um, to understand um, how it could work, um, and that was, that was really important. The manager's coaching as well was, was critical um, to address the manager's concerns and ready them for um, making the consultation process as effective as possible for their, for their team members. Um, and as part of the training, then we covered a number of areas um, with managers, which is about the business case of flexible working and having a family-friendly culture, the process for managing requests, how to manage flexible workers, how to develop a team approach to creating a flexible and agile workforce. Um, and also there, there was competencies for managers um, that, that were key as well as for employees about you know, their communication skills, um, how they would monitor employees to, to see, to make sure that they're not feeling isolated and, and also to keep an eye on the, the working hours. So once you'd agreed sort of your way of working, making sure that, that your employees were working within that framework and perhaps not working longer, as, as you mentioned, with Blackberries, then, you know, and, and technology, it's not the assumption that people are going to work longer hours. Um, so making sure that there were checks and balances in place for that. Um, and yeah. if managers had got some concerns and wanted further training over various elements, then, then we would give additional training to them as well. Um, the team building workshops, again, another key factor because um, I think that this is what really helped make it work for individuals um, because they could, they would have a one-to-one, -one, um, they would have a personal survey to decide how they thought they, they could work um, flexibly, so how they currently worked, how they would want to work going forward, how they think it would, would help benefit them and the business. Um, and then they would share those with their manager and then they would discuss those um, at a team building workshop um, and then they could discuss and work together um, about how they could function even more successfully as a flexible group so that they were aware of when people were coming into the office, how to get hold of them, how to access them, even agreeing, you know, if, if, if someone sends an email or a telephone then you know, as a team, we'll try and commit to responding within X amount of time. So Absolutely. I think that that then got people on board. And because we went out to people, we were proactively saying, look, how you know, you don't have to change, but let's consider how you could do your job um, flexibly and, and which worker type you would you would fall into. Um, and so because we went out proactively, it encouraged people to think differently. And, um, and, and then together as a team, they had the discussion and there wasn't this, oh, why is one person doing that and, and why can't I do this? Because there was an understanding of, of individuals' needs, they could then come together and talk about how they could best make that work as a team. So I think that then helped to overcome some of those thoughts about, oh, well, why is so-and-so leaving at this time? Because people had a greater understanding of, of people's needs and people's working patterns. Absolutely. Um, it was also there worth talking about how they could maintain team cohesion and therefore yeah. how they could make sure that they would get the team together for regular team meetings or events um, that would mean that they would maintain that team spirit um, and also then for the manager to share how, you know, how he would continue with his one-to-ones. And, and what was the best way of communicating with people um, that manage re that work remotely? Absolutely, Mel. I'm um, aware of the time, and there are a couple of questions coming in. Plus, there are some individuals who have who have asked beforehand if they could um, contribute. So, can I just put a couple of those questions to you? I know that we've got various slides um, of yours, but I, just to respond to the questions that come in. Thank you. So, a couple of particular questions. What about where? 
um, a manager indicates that there's a drop in performance, which could be just their resistance to somebody having a flexible working arrangement and perceiving that drop in performance. Um, and how do you really transform the culture? Also another question, have we examples of where that's happened in call centers? Yeah, I think um, if I take the last one first, the call centers for us um, is more about different start and finish times and shift working because of the nature of the role and also teleworking. So that's the way we, we get flexibility into, into call centers. Um, with regards to um, commitment then, it is important to have senior sponsorship. Um, we still have managers that perhaps have had a bad experience um, of, of a flexible worker perhaps and a, a, a resistance. So for us it has been about continuing that um, communication of the, the benefits, sharing success stories, having our um, brand sponsors to support and share best practice um, and, and promote that across, across the business. And I think the other thing is we've always said, you know, if, you, if you're not sure, just have a trial and put in place your measures of success um, and, and agree those and then review those um, at the end of the trial process to see whether it's going to work. Um, and so we would always encourage the manager to take that approach. Mm. In fact, I think um, Niall Mackin from Amex, um, is, oh, is he, he's not showing up on the line at the moment, because he was somebody who said he would like to, to make a comment, and he was all about how in a sales environment it was really possible to set targets and then evidence how people could meet those even while working flexibly. So that was a, a point well made there as well. Um, we've also got Alison Franklin of the London Deanery, who I've, I've talked with previously who wanted to to contribute a little bit about the, the kind of two-way street that needs to exist with individuals and managers looking at what an arrangement might look like. So I'm going to just try and unmute Alison now. Um, in fact, let's have a look. We're, Alison, I think if you're on the phone there, you need to put in hash 79 hash to be unmuted. So hash 79 hash, Alison and then we'll be able to hear you. So, yes, thank you, Mel. Uh, there's some really kind of practical things that we can do there about capturing success and, and transmitting it and transferring it across the organization. So thank you for that. Um, so while, while we're seeing whether Alison is able to put in her pin and, and join in, Mel, would you like to go on? Um, I don't know if we're still on the leadership and cultural commitment slide. Uh, I, I mean, I think just to say there, the other um, factor that was really um, key to the success of our um, flexible working program is having a dedicated um, manager and a dedicated intranet site and on which, which offers guidance and support. Um, there's a day in the life of a flexible worker, flexible working FAQs, best practice, top tips, office protocol, health and safety, how to be a smart worker, virtual meeting zones, um, checklists for employees and managers. So that sort of support which is always available there and also the training. Um, and then I think the, the final slide for me was just about the success story to so the impact, the positive impact that the flexible working has had on our business. Um, we also did a, oh sorry, yes, we've got some quotes from our employees um, just really reiterating um, the benefits, the fact that they're more productive, less stressed, haven't been ill since they've um, been working flexibly, that they, they sense that the culture has, has really changed and new people coming in, so they feel that it's a very flexible company, um, mm -hmm. that we're definitely ahead of the game, that they wouldn't want to give it up now that they've got it and they don't know whether they'd get that in another organisation. Um, so that was some, some good sound bites from our employees. And then some of the, the metrics, which I know managers are, are keen to see in the business. Yes, um, somebody's just asked a question about what exactly was the impact, so that will answer this. And somebody yeah. else was saying, when did you start on the process? This started um, back in, the pilot was in 2004, and then WorkWise um, was, was rolled out in 2005. Um, and I think since then we've just built on it. Um, Muted. Apologies. 
apologies. I think Melanie has been muted. I just need to put it on mute now. I'm very sorry, Mel. We just touched you by right. mistake. I don't know why. I was, so I was looking at the, I was reviewing questions and pressed the wrong button. Apologies. life and how you have the policies to support that and I think that having a generally supportive family friendly culture helps with the success because I think you've got to look at your health safety and well-being of your employees you've got to consider you know um, carers working mothers working fathers you've got to consider people that are perhaps wanting more flexibility in retirement you've got to have all of those other policies and practices practices supporting um, to help bring flexibility in, in, into the organisation and, and make it live. Mm, absolutely. Well, thank you, thank you very much, Mel. I think that's given us quite an insight into the impact. I mean, one of the questions that was raised was whether that was the driver. Did you set out as an organisation to, to save costs or did you just find that you saved costs through something that you thought was a better way of working? It, it was it was both. It was driving in parallel new ways of working whilst also making a more effective use of office space. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Um, one of the things that we promised to touch on, which is, is not necessarily so strongly present for, for Centrica, because not all of your, your people are, are customer facing, but many of them will be. But many of the people that had written in challenges were saying it's really difficult in a role where you're serving the client, you're expected to be there at their beck and call. I know Accenture, for example, who are strong award winners in this field as well, like Centrica, um, make a virtue of it. They, they build it into their brand image and they sit down with clients at the outset of a consultancy project and look at how they're going to collaborate in light of how the person works. And one of the things that I think really helps in, in making the first step there is understanding, for example, if you're a law firm, if you're a consultancy firm like Accenture, then the clients you are serving are also driving towards flexibility and wondering how to make it happen. And they are also very often looking for diversity in their suppliers and so these things go hand in hand and somebody's got to, to speak up first. And of course there can be other reasons for a person not being available 24-7. They could be meeting with another client for example and sometimes it's, it's about looking at smarter ways of working that enable different sharing of work between people. Also job shares, I think one of the least explored forms of flexible working, hard to get right, needs a strong matching of work ethics and values between individuals but has a lot of scope and um, one of the award winners in the Working Mums Awards, award winner for talent attraction this year, virtual sales team, just a, a quote from the managing director Andrew Smart there about how they've made a virtue of flexible working so they actually really make a play of it in front of customers to say in fact two things quite strongly. Firstly, we're going to have brilliant talent because we can engage people that would have fallen out of the workforce. And also, research has shown that people making sales calls in short bursts are more effective than people working hour after hour. So sometimes it's about finding the way of opening the conversation and having that conversation effectively. Now, I know that we're coming towards the end of, of the time that we have available here. We'll send you some more information when we do send you the slides. There'll be a, a few more bits and pieces on there for you to pick up on. But here on the screen are some of the tips and successes that people shared when we invited them to on registration. So that'll be there for you to see when you get the slides. Just a, a word that we sometimes need to do a bit of scenario planning within our own organizations and say where are we heading and what sort of organization do we want to be and I'd point you towards PwC's great research in managing tomorrow's people to look at the different worlds that we might be heading to and what kind of organization you'd like to be designing. Um, just a, a kind of throwaway sort of interesting quote there from um, this chief information officer of FedEx saying you know Gen Y are already doing this kind of thing in online gaming you know collaborating online working in, in kind of easily passed on collaborative phases. So, you know, we may not need to train Generation Y as much as we need to train the current people to get their heads around this. 
So just rounding off as we, we draw to the close of our time, just a few points that really capture a lot of what Mel has kindly shared with us this morning and a lot of what comes from the various other sources we've pointed to. So it's about cultural commitment, it's about understanding the, the implications of real estate, technology and people. It's about managers very resoundingly. And it's about you know things like recruitment and attraction and removing bias in those areas. At an individual level, real need for training and development to be able to manage the otherwise always on culture, but equally balancing with that, a real need to get very business focused about how we work, how we focus on deliverables, making a business case for flexibility, not simply asking for it as a favor. And looking at the way individuals can engage with each other and get a, a social side to work as well as just producing the goods and looking again as we touched earlier on the practical support that people may need outside of work to make it work. And one of the things that we'd urge you to do is to begin making your own plans, identifying, going around, doing a kind of audit, whether you're heading towards flexibility as a way of doing business or you're just looking to get better at being flexible for people that really need it. Doing a mini audit of who needs what, what are the challenges, this could come out of focus groups and, and what might their needs be and we've just thrown up on the screen there a few things that you know it might be the kind of thing you'd come up with when you, you do that. So whatever we do next, you know, make a start, get something going and carry on engaging with peers in discussing this because I think one of the best ways is to find out what's working elsewhere. Um, let us know if, if you'd like to take part in other webinars like this in the future because that's something that we can provide and enable if there's an appetite for it. And um, there will be a, a, a survey that you can take part in when we close the webinar, so please do let us know there if there are other topics as well that you'd like us to, to explore. Um, we can support you in various ways. Do let us know if you'd like anything further from us within your own organizations. And I would just like once more to thank Mel Flogdell from Centrica very, very much for sharing in a very open and very practical way your experience this morning. Really appreciate that. Um, and also all of you who have attended and taken the time to engage in this topic. Many thanks. And we'll, we'll close there.